Good morning and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today in um, our new uh, webinar series related to the issues um, surrounding COVID-19 and how we know that's impacting each one of your businesses out there. I appreciate the robust participation today and we are very honored to have with us today Thomas Sullivan um, with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he is the Vice President of Small Business Policy, um, and he has worked with us, uh, or worked with uh, small businesses um, from grassroots uh, to help uh, with the federal policies that bolster our free enterprise and reward entrepreneurship. So he runs the U.S. Chamber's Small Business Council and engages all of the small businesses around the country on a regular basis uh, for input and involvement. Um, and we will uh, just wanted to um, remind you all that we are working to provide uh, more online uh, uh, information to you all. We have our online lunch uh, webinar, which will be um, in April with Chris Keel, uh, the economist, to talk about the economic impact of um, COVID-19 in our economy and on your business. And then we are hosting our weekly AM, uh, virtual AM connects every Wednesday morning. So um, if you will hold for one moment, we will uh, have Mr. Sullivan join us. One minute while we get our panelists lined up here, just one moment. As we wait for our panelists to join us, I do want to just remind you all about the importance of uh, supporting our local businesses that are open during the time. Um, we have many restaurants that are out there. And so uh, take an opportunity to support those local businesses that have supported our community um, for so many years. And I believe we have um, Tom online. So I will turn uh, it over to Mr. Sullivan, Vice President of Small Business Policy with the US Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tom. Oh, thank you, Anne. And I apologize about uh, technical difficulties. Um, this is, I guess, the, the new way of, of business. Uh, on Friday, in the middle of trying to inform small businesses about options to weather the coronavirus, um, my 13-year-old son logged on to uh, Xbox and shut down the entire PowerPoint. So. Um, that's just something that I guess we're, we're getting used to. So I do apologize. Um, no, no worries. We're working things out on our end, too. It's all new to a lot of us. It is. And so I'm going to try to call up my PowerPoint, if that's OK. Um, yes. And it says that I can't share while someone else is sharing. Well, that's not very nice. We're, I'm in a sharing household. I think everybody should be able to share. <laughs> all right, let's see. Uh, 
I got it. You got it. I got it. And so let's see how I do the. Mm -hmm. Slideshow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not it. So I'm going to try to get on the main presenter view. How's that? That works. Okay. Uh, again, apologies for some of the technical challenges, but um, I'll, I'll plunge right into it. So. Um, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, about four weeks ago, um, we started operating on a, on a very simple principle, and that is that no uh, business and no family should be bankrupted because of the temporary economic disruption uh, caused by the coronavirus pandemic. We worked uh, feverishly, night and day, to work with Congress in the White House to pass three laws in three weeks. And now we've shifted from a lobbying uh, strategy to an information and education strategy. And that's why it's so nice to be able to talk with you, Anne, and, and your membership this morning so that we can try to get uh, accurate answers to help small businesses know what types of federal resources are available. I'm gonna focus almost entirely on the CARES Act that was signed into law um, a, week, a, week, a week ago Friday, so um, about less than 10 days ago. This contains significant uh, resources for small businesses, and there's really two, two sources of money that the $349 billion intended to help small businesses get through the pandemic uh, really comes from two places. The first is SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. And then the second is a new loan program called the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, that latter loan program just went live on Friday. There are a number of banks actually lending throughout the weekend. Um, and then there have been some changes ongoing as we look to a, a next tranche on this Friday to help small businesses. Um, I've heard it compared to a bunch of different things about the speed at which uh, folks are moving. Uh, I think probably the most accurate is that we are building the space shuttle as it's rocketing towards Mars. So the first source of federal resources intended to help small businesses uh, is the EIDL loan program. That stands for Economic Injury Disaster Loans, EIDL. Now, it's important to note that this is not a new loan program. This is a loan program that has been around for about 60 years, uh, although it has certainly been boosted not only in the public sphere, but also with the money that is available uh, when Congress took action. Uh, actually, this was one of the first, you know, they boosted, uh, they boosted the loan amounts in this program. Small businesses, nonprofits, uh, with basically 500 or fewer employees are able to apply. Uh, also, the eligibility was expanded a little bit to ESOPs, self-employed, sole proprietors, independent contractors. Now, this low interest loan program provides $2 million in working capital for a term, a 30 year term. It's also worth noting that the head of SBA, Javita Carranza, uh, postponed all interest in payments. If you get an idle loan, uh, she postponed the interest in payments for an entire year. The, uh, the rate is 3.75% for businesses, 2.75% for nonprofits. Uh, now, there is an, another added incentive to take out an idle loan, and, which was added under the CARES Act. 
you can receive up to $10,000 grant. Um, it does not have to be paid back. It's also not even tied to the SBA disaster loan acceptance. The only caveat is that if you do get the grant up to $10,000, that amount is not part of the forgiveness amount in a payment protection, excuse me, paycheck protection program loan that, that I will um, discuss in a minute. It's also last but not least, certainly worth pointing out the streamlining that has gone on at the Small Business Administration over the last two weeks. They have used technology to make the loan application process easier. Um, I still think it's not easy enough, but they're getting there. Um, the loan application is done online. Uh, it is at sba.gov slash disaster. And uh, it could take between 15 and 20 minutes to apply. I am told that a small business owner um, who was on a call last week used his iPhone and actually submitted the application in less than 15 minutes. So they've really certainly come a long way. Um, and we are hearing that there is a backlog, um, but still easier to get your name into the system. Uh, this is a first come first serve loan uh, program. So it's important to get that application in uh, as soon as possible. Now I talked about this new loan program, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, it's, it's important to make a distinction of where the money comes from. So the SBA disaster loans, the idols, come directly from the Small Business Administration. The Paycheck Protection Program loans come from private banks. Now, last Friday, when this loan program opened up, the only banks that were uh, offering the, what are called PPP loans, are what are called SBA lenders. These are a group of about 8,000 banks who have a contractual relationship with the Small Business Administration because they actually provide the loans for a lot of SBA programs that go on in the normal course of business outside of the disaster arena. So those are SBA lenders. They started lending on Friday, um, but the money comes from them, uh, not, not SBA. So this is where the bulk of the $349 billion in stimulus come from. Um, the rate on these loans is 1% over two years. Um, and there is a legislatively driven calculation for how much a loan amount can be. That calculation is for a small business, they take your monthly average payroll from last year for any payroll that is up to $100,000. You average that by month and then you multiply that monthly average times 2.5. That's your loan amount. Then fast forward to the end of June, if 75% of your loan proceeds are used for payroll, you are able then actually to convert that loan into a grant. Now, there, is, there are incentives in this program to hire back employees who have been furloughed or let go. And as long as you hire them back before June 30th, then you're able to count them into the calculation, which must add up to 75% payroll in order to convert that loan into a grant. Uh, one item that we get a ton of questions about is whether or not 1099 payments, payments to independent contractors, can be used as part of the calculation for that monthly average payroll. The answer is no. Those independent contractors, the 1099 recipients, they are able to apply themselves for a Paycheck Protection Program loan. 
um, and, and therefore they are not able to be taken care of by a small business owner who utilizes their, their services. So from a latest news perspective, again, because this is kind of like building a space shuttle in the middle of rocketing on your way to, to Mars, things seem to be breaking pretty fast and furiously. On Saturday, um, SBA and Department of Treasury put out rules having to do with the churches. Uh, we also heard that Wells Fargo uh, opened up for these loans, but then reached a $10 billion cap uh, and, and shut the program down. And now they're exploring on whether or not how they can reopen the program. Um, this Friday on April 10th, uh, the banks are, off, are supposed to begin offering the Paycheck Protection Program loans to sole proprietors, self-employed and independent contractors. Uh, on Friday, this past Friday, it was just employer-based small businesses with SBA lenders. Now, the, the intention is that more lenders will start offering these loans and they are working with SBA to get approved. We haven't heard that any additional non-SBA lenders are in the system yet, but I know folks are working around the clock to make that happen. We got a question earlier today uh, asking if you are a self-employed or an independent contractor, what types of discussions should you be having with a bank prior to Friday? And the answer is you should be having those discussions with the banks, in particular SBA lenders. Um, ask someone who you have a banking relationship with whether they're gonna be offering these PPP loans to independent contractors on Friday, and then ask them what type of documentation for the prior year sales, because in an independent contractor, it's not necessarily your payroll average, it's, this, it's your um, sales and receipts average going up to $100,000. So I, th I believe your, uh, the maximum loan amount is $20,833. Um, you should be having those discussions with your bankers now so that you have all the documentation in order before Friday when they begin offering these loans. Now, uh, we are trying at the US Chamber in partnerships with the Shawnee Chamber and, and close to 6,000 other state and local chambers of commerce. It is our mission to get information to all of you. So we are trying not only to get simple and easy to understand information out, but also to continually update this information uh, to give you the latest and the greatest. And our small business digital portal is listed here, uschamber.com slash co. Um, those are narrated, narrated uh, stories and information that uh, try to get this information out to as many small businesses as possible. Uh, we would hate for a small business to close not knowing that there are federal resources available to them. So, and with that, I'll pause. I'd be happy to, uh, to take any questions, if that's okay. Um, yes, we've got a few questions coming in. Um, I do have a, a question. Can you uh, elaborate at all on what you think the next um, stimulus package will look like for small businesses? I know that there's sort of the, the next phase that's in discussion. What can we expect to see come out of that? Well, I think the first thing, and probably the most important thing is more money. And very clear from seeing the type of demand, not only for webinars like we're having right now, but also the demand at banks, the demand at SBA. I mean, shoot, and we had a, a webinar with Inc. Magazine um, over a week ago, and there were 10,000 people signed up in less than four hours. So we know that demand is putting pressure on banks and we know that they're gonna run out of that $349 billion pretty quickly. So the direct answer to your question is the first um, action item before Congress will be to add money to make sure that small businesses survive through the pandemic. Um, we have had conversations with 
Republicans and Democratic senators and congressmen, and no one wants to tell a small business owner who is the next in line that I'm sorry, you don't get a loan. We ran out of money and you have to close down. And we have gotten commitments that if more money is needed, then Congress will take lightning quick action to make it happen. So I think that that's the most probable because we've gotten such good feedback from folks uh, from, from Congress that that will happen. And the president um, on Saturday at about noon reiterated his commitment to make sure that when more money is needed, it will be lightning fast to make sure that small businesses are able to survive the pandemic. So that's probably the first order of business. Uh, the second order of business is that distinction between what the intent is and how the law is being applied. No matter how much you want to get money to every different type of small business, inevitably there's some type of legal loophole that you're just not able to see. And when Congress and, and local chambers and, and the president were trying to pass three laws in three weeks, we heard from small businesses that there's this balance of speed versus perfection. And the small businesses told us, go for speed. And, and it's obvious as this is being implemented that this is not a set of perfect laws. And so there will likely be amendments to try to bring in parts of communities that were unintentionally left out. Um, but speed continues to be the focus and, and that's where the more money immediately comes in. On the second, on the perfection side that will probably take a little bit longer, there are parts of our communities that have been left out by mistake and, and Congress will have to kind of reconvene and figure that out. Um, and I just wanna say, I know um, to our members that are listening, um, we've been in contact with our Kansas representatives, um, both in the House and the Senate, and, and they um, are wanting to hear from the small businesses as well to make sure, of course, that they're representing and, and um, conveying the needs of those small businesses. So um, certainly that's always an opportunity for you guys. We can uh, funnel that through the chamber at any time, um, but uh, they are interested. They are wanting to know how they can, you know, again, work a little bit more towards perfection on these bills. Um, so, uh, and uh, just a reminder to all the participants that um, you can ask questions. There's the chat function and there's the Q&A. Um, and if that's okay, Tom, I'll just kind of start going through some of these. Oh, please. Um, can a small business uh, have a staff laid off and collect unemployment during the next four to eight weeks, but then hire them back by uh, June 30th and still qualify for the loan forgiveness? In other words, does staff getting unemployment disqualify the small business for loan forgiveness? Uh, so Ann, the simple answer is no. Having staff um, collect unemployment does not prevent them from being hired back and then the small business being able to take advantage of the forgiveness component. Um, it's worth noting that in all three of the laws that were passed, the focus was on the individuals. We, we know certainly from our business, from, from what we do, and you and, and me, that we're advocating for business first. Um, at the beginning of this pandemic, there was the realization that this is a health crisis, which particularly hits individuals. And there's this desire to help an individual um, so that they're able to take care of themselves, uh, take care of their loved ones, and do anything possible to get the health care that they need, which costs money. Uh, and so when there's this focus on keeping people on a payroll or making sure that there's a state unemployment system that has enough money to support the types of millions of folks who are looking for unemployment assistance, um, the focus was getting cash into individuals' pocketbooks. And then luckily in the CARES Act, they also 
are trying to take care of small business owners themselves. But the focus is, has primarily been on the individual and making sure that they have personal liquidity because a health crisis demands that people have money to be able to take care of themselves. Right. Um, okay, so how does this work for a seasonal business? Is it oh, so Anne, and I'm glad that you asked that because uh, sometimes I, I, I skip over that. There are special provisions for seasonal, for the calculation of seasonal employees. And basically, that they take, they allow for you to take um, two of the months that are your typical um, seasonal employee hiring for the employee count and then enable you to hire back up to that amount uh, by the end of June. But, but keep in mind, I, and I think this is, this is an important distinction I think that some folks miss. So when you're calculating the loan amount, yes, you want that full amount to be forgiven, that it's a grant, but you also want the greatest amount of liquidity many times to get through the pandemic. We don't want small businesses to be necessarily shouldered by unreasonable debt coming out, but at, but at a 1% interest over two years, a pretty attractive terms so that um, even if they get the loan and aren't able to bring their employee count back up, you still are providing liquidity to get through the pandemic. And we're hoping that small businesses really fuel an economic resurgence so that the economy can get back on track. It's a long way of answering that yes, there are specific provisions for seasonal workers, but I didn't, I didn't want to skip over the important fact that you're not always, it's, a, it's impossible for everyone to get the loan to get all of that loan forgiven. And there's a rec and certain, certain businesses need more liquidity than others, but it's that type of calculation that should be done uh, with the small business themselves and their advisors. I say advisors because, as, as you know, Ann, it's all different. You know, it, it could be your next door neighbor, it could be your mentor, it could be, uh, it could be your mother or your father who maybe had uh, ran the business before you did. But those discussions of balancing liquidity now and long-term debt or, well, two-year debt, those are the discussions that have to happen um, before they go into a bank or actually in conjunction with going into a bank to try to get these PPP loans. Right. And we've got uh, some information on our website. I think some of it's sourced from the U.S. Chamber, but just uh, some of that information that you will need to have ready when you go talk to your banker. Um, so here's another question. If an individual worked as an independent contractor for nine months of last year's business, then switched to an employee at the end of the year and is still an employee as of now, do they qualify for the PPP for their own independent contractor work last year? Um, so yes and no. So, <laughs> it <was> nuanced. <laughs> uh, yes, they, the salaries as an employee can get factored into the monthly averaging, but it's going to be a lower. It's going to be a lower average. Uh, okay. You cannot. You cannot take the amount that was paid to that person as a 1099 and fold that in. Uh, and 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 you're actually pointing out a an ironic flaw that actually happened more than we thought. And and it's it's a good news bad news situation. So the, if you remember back to January, that seems over a year ago, but it, it, right, really, yeah. it was just a few months ago. So I keep saying March was the longest year of my life. Um, small business confidence was at an all time high. And there were many businesses that were on a growth trajectory. So how crazy is it that those small businesses who were on a growth trajectory and hired up in December, January, and February actually are not able to account for that in the payroll calculations. So there's this bizarre situation that we're in where 
the businesses that as chamber officials, we want to applaud and embrace because they've been, they've been killing it, but they're actually penalized a little bit by the calculation that anyone in a growth mode from January, February, March, um, or January, February, actually isn't able to account for that in the prior year um, uh, payroll calculations. Okay, yeah. Um, so what is the process uh, to get an uh, economic injury loan or grant versus a loan? So the grant is $10,000, an online application, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, so the loan itself, uh, the loan itself is, is a 30 year term loan and can be up to $2 million. So um, that process is actually very much like many loan processes. Um, you, you apply, you don't actually put down a dollar amount in your application. Several weeks later, you talk with a loan officer from the federal government. They work out kind of what they, they and you believe uh, is a reasonable amount of debt. Um, in this process, they actually do look at cash on hand. Um, they, will not, uh, they will not give disaster loans for small businesses that are flush with cash um, because from the federal government's perspective, they don't need them as much as, as, a, as another uh, business. But on the third screen of that online application, there's a little box that says, would you like to be considered for up to a $10,000 grant? All the small businesses who talked to me have said they've checked yes on that box. And this grant, really the approach by Congress, and this was Senator Ben Cardin, uh, from Maryland, it was kind of his baby in this, um, that like, we gotta get, we gotta get cash onto Main Street now. And so the idea was to provide that liquidity fast and don't even really worry about a small business paying it back. So if you, um, if you apply for that grant, you can get $10,000. You can keep that 10,000, even if you don't get a disaster loan. And, and how swiftly can somebody expect to receive those funds if they apply for the grant portion? Well, Congress had wanted it to be three days and that's not working out. Um, it's taken, it's the, because of the backlog and the enormous surge of requests, it's taking several weeks. Okay. And can you clarify how the, um, the EIDL loan will interface with the uh, PPP? So it's, the grants incorporated, correct, somehow? Yes, so I'm glad that you asked that. There is um, a little bit of a, of a web that exists, and if you get an EIDL loan from SBA, how does that interact with a PPP loan? So the simplest way of putting it is you cannot commingle these loans. So if you use the PPP for payroll, you're not supposed to use, excuse me, if you use the EIDL loan for payroll, you're not supposed to use uh, the other loan for the same purposes. However, uh, this is an emergency situation and, and Congress recognized if you do use an EIDL loan for payroll, you must refinance it into the PPP loan. So these loans can be refinanced in. The downside from a small business owner is some of them don't want to see just a two-year term. You'd rather see a uh, fixed rate 30 year term uh, with, with principal and interest deferred for a year. So it really depends on the situation. There are refinancing opportunities, but the simple rule is you should not commingle the funds. If you use um, one loan for one reason, you can't, you shouldn't uh, use the other loan for the same reason. Okay. Okay. Um, are healthcare and payroll taxes considered payroll as far as the PPP loans are concerned? Uh, and you're, you're hitting all of the great questions. Thank you. Well, it's uh, really our members, but. <laughs> so uh, the simple answer is yes. Healthcare and retirement benefits are included in the payroll calculation. However, there is a part that is not calculated in, and that those are all federal taxes. So the 
the easiest way to do it is you take your gross, um, you take the monthly payroll calculation um, and up to $100,000 per individual, and, then, and that's the gross payroll. Then you subtract out uh, federal taxes. So uh, FICA taxes uh, is probably the biggest chunk. And then that is the actual amount for you to be using. The state and local taxes uh, on unemployment in particular, uh, those are able to be part of the calculation, uh, but the no federal taxes on, on both the employer side and the employee side are allowed to be used in that calculation. Let's see. Um, so how would the PPP loan apply to a self-owned daycare that has lost income? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, so, I guess? so um, that's a realization that actually 80% of the 30 million business, small businesses in the United States are, are self-employed, sole proprietors, uh, some Schedule C, uh, excuse me, S-Corps. Um, they all are eligible for the PPP loans. Now, the calculation is a little bit different because instead of payroll, so a lot of um, non-employer businesses don't um, have their themselves as payroll. There are some that, that do, um, but instead, the way that the law outlines it is you use your gross receipts from last year. And again, um, you can't be above 100,000. So you take your growth, gross receipts from last year uh, and then do a monthly average times two and a half. Uh, rough, rough estimate that is um, approximately $20,833 loan. Um, that's based on if you had, <clears throat> um, if you maxed out on the $100,000 um, and, and then multiply it by two and a half. Um, what about owners that receive a large portion of income on a K-1? Uh, so, if, so if you're a self-employed, in the scenario that we just talked about, and that's folded into the overall business income, it gets capped at 100000 total. So you still can't get the loan for above $20,833. Um, if, but K-1 isn't payroll. So if you're an employer business, it's not, the employer business isn't calculating it on, re, on revenue, it's calculating it on payroll. K-1 isn't payroll income. So it's outside of, it's outside of the context of the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, it gets tricky though, if you're self-employed and you've got significant K-1 income, uh, gets, a, gets a little bit tricky because I don't know if a bank would consider that business income. Um, I would suspect though um, that you get pretty close to that $100,000 threshold pretty quickly and it's just you, that that maximum isn't, isn't flexible. Um, so you noted that contractors cannot be included in the calculation, Correct. but, um, this member's understanding is that, um, this is only the case if the contractor is part of a larger entity. So if the contractor is a 1099 individual mm -hmm. on specific individual retainer to the company, then they should count that in the total. Is there understanding? Can you clarify on any caveats to the contractor rule? We, we read that differently. Um, in the guidance that, in the interim rule that SBA put out uh, on Thursday night at about 11 p.m., it said that 1099 payments are not um, included in the payroll calculation. And so we don't read that to mean that there's any distinction between large or small with regard to hiring 1099. Okay. So, uh, and again though, so I think that this back and forth is actually very valuable because 
ultimately in the in the PPP um, loans, it's going to be up to the lender to say, "This is the calculation. This is your loan." Um, we're providing as much guidance to help small businesses and and chambers of commerce to get their members ready for that discussion, but. Um, we have heard stories of some banks uh, interpreting different things one way and other banks interpreting things another way. I think the beauty of the system is intended that those decisions be made where the banker is in a best position to know the small business. They're able to know, is that business going to make it? How can I help that small business make up, make it? And if the PPP loan is going to help, we're convinced that a local banker is going to make that good decision a lot better than folks in Washington, D.C., where I live and work, could do. So I'm not saying that the process is always going to be resolved in a way that is a more expansive view uh, of that calculation. But I think the intention by letting the local bankers make some of these decisions is that get that decision as close to the relationship as possible so that those folks who emotionally have a stake in the survival of that small business are making the decisions. And you know, we've got a lot of uh, small business lenders that are members of our chamber that are um, uh, ready and willing to help our, our, our all of our members. Um, let's see, sorry, I got a text question. Um, are banks running out of funds in general for the PPP and the idle loans? Is that something that you're hearing? Uh, I, I wouldn't say anything these days could be said generally, uh, because everyone is so different. I mean, we saw community banks uh, and national banks really step up on Friday. Um, the only instance of a bank capping, uh, the amount was over the weekend, Wells Fargo um, had experienced their volumes up to what they understood their maximum exposure could be under um, the different bank oversight rules. And I know that they're working together right now with the Office of the Comptroller of Currency to see how to get around that. Um, but that's the only one that I heard bumped up into a cap uh, over the weekend. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of other stories about the challenges that the banks are having. Uh, I, I'm hoping, I, I'm only half kidding by saying this, but I'm hoping when we're all able to like shake hands and hug after the <laughs> pandemic that we institute like a hug your banker day because, <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there's so many parts of the communities that we're seeing um, just work night and day. I mean, our friends who are the district directors uh, of SBA, uh, I've seen them on hundreds of webinars like this. Um, I, I've seen bank executives um, all across the country working 24 hours a day to try to help their local community. And obviously, we see small business owners um, looking after their neighbors more than they're looking after themselves. It's part of the amazing fabric um, that, Anne, you, you certainly are in the middle of and we're very proud of at the U.S. Chamber. Um, yeah, well, I know, um, you know, I've talked to many of our bankers, they're, they're really working hard to put their arms around, um, put their arms around the, the rules and the regulations, and then also just to put their arms around those businesses that make up our community. Um, let's see, uh, how is the approved loan amount going to be established for the economic injury disaster loan? Is it a percentage of gross income, realizing that they're seems to be a minimum of 10,000 offered. You're reading that right? See, there's, there's no, uh, I, I don't know if there, that there's a minimum. Uh, I know there's a maximum of 2 million and we 
have an assessment of the grant that can be up to 10,000, but that doesn't relate to the amount of money uh, that you can get in an idle loan. The $10,000 grant is, as I've been told, is calculated on number of employees, because again, the entire push from Congress has been, let's get paychecks to continue to em employees. Um, the size of the loan is very similar to the normal loan process many small businesses are familiar with. You, you go in with, with balance sheets and say, this is the amount of debt that I can afford to take on. This is the cash that I have on hand. Um, I need liquidity. And there is this negotiation that happens between the banker, excuse me, the federal official, who's kind of a pseudo banker at this point, and the small business. So it, it's, that's a long way of not giving you a direct answer because I don't know the black box that um, goes through the calculation, but I do know that it is a discussion between an SBA official who is basically the loan officer and the small business owner that I've been told is analogous to the same discussions that happen in the normal course of lending between a small business and a banker. Um, so understand as our uh, economy is, as we um, will and, and we'll get through all of this, um, I'm presuming that some of our businesses will hire back at different time periods as they uh, ramp up. So can, is that acceptable and, and how does, do you know how that would figure into the calculation and the repayment if they're hiring maybe 50% back in the first couple of months and then another 50% back? six months later. So, um, so th the laws that got passed actually don't look at a horizon past June as far as the stimulus goes. So the hiring back incentives are by the end of June. So, and, and, and the way that the rule, SBA's rules that tried to clarify this, what is able to be forgiven there was an attempt to simplify it by the head of SBA who just said, look, 75% of your loan has to go to payroll. That, that's basically it. Um, mm -hmm. And the other 25%, there are some criteria about um, interest on mortgage, lease payments, rental payments, um, and utilities uh, can be part of that remaining 25%. Um, and as long as you're able to show that that 75% went to payroll, um, then we are hopeful that that, um, that the entire amount be forgiven. Okay, okay. Um, here's a question. Um, I am hearing from many business owners that they are not able to apply for a PPP loan because they do not have a loan history with a bank. Are there suggestions on where to turn? I do not have a business loan relationship with a bank. So, uh, so that that has a number of kind of questions built into one question. Uh, so the first lender, um, the first national lender was Bank of America, and it limited applicants to those small business customers who had taken out loans before. And, and there was a reason for that. And it had to do with um, some anti-money laundering requirements that require banks to know who their customers are from a, um, uh, from a national security perspective before they're able to, to loan money. The intent, so it was the quickest way for them to get cash out the door was to narrow in on that subpopulation in their accounts. The intention, however, was that they work through these issues with federal regulators so that they could expand the number of people they loan to. Um, the way that, that it was explained to me is it's like blowing up a new balloon. So when you blow up a new balloon, you want to blow just a little bit of air and then kind of stretch it out before you 
push the maximum amount of air to get the balloon bigger, otherwise it bursts immediately. Um, so that's the intention, but we don't know yet uh, on whether or not there are greater flexibility within some of the national banks to be loaning outside what is technically their comfort zone from a bank regulator perspective. Unfortunately, this is a terrible time not to have a good relationship with a banker for a small business. Um, I, I could sugarcoat it, but there couldn't be a worse time. Um, I have heard stories of people getting so fed up they actually drive to the bank. I, I, I would caution against that because that puts people's health at risk. Um, for those people who know a, someone in their banking community, I have heard dozens of stories of outreach to a banker who is not providing a PPP loan, suggesting that that person who they have a relationship with go to one of their friends in the banking community because they all want to help. You know, I, I don't know, Anne, what your experience has been, but for me as, as a dad, you know, the, the, the scariest part as a dad is when your child gets hurt and you don't know who to call. And I have a friend who is an orthopedic surgeon, but he has, he has no idea what to do with a kid who can't breathe because of a bronchial asthma um, condition. But he was the first guy I called. And, and like the bankers right now, my friend Mark immediately gave me the name of an asthma specialist to help my kid. I, I think that that's what's going on right now. And it's, it's really, really frustrating, but at the same time, incredibly, um, uh, it, it's just incredibly heartwarming because as Anne, as you had said, you've got so many bankers in your local chamber. Some of them aren't providing PPP loans. I can guarantee you every phone call they get, they're recommending some of their friends who are doing PPP loans and doing everything possible to connect those people so that the small business survives. And I think that that's what's going on here. We are working so, so hard to expand that network. We're trying to get lenders like American Express uh, on deck, uh, Cabbage, and all sorts of, of banks into this because we think that the bigger the, the bigger the pie, the less frustrated these folks will feel not being able to get what they view right now as a very small slice. Um, and and we're, we're trying to get our friends at SBA and Treasury to just increase this pie so that businesses have more options. Right. Well, and um, so really think what you're talking about is the power of, of a chamber, of creating those relationships and those networks and understanding what our neighboring businesses are doing and, and, and creating that community, which is so important to me to do for our community of Shawnee on um, helping each other and, and knowing what everybody is doing and staying on top of that. And of course, we will um, gladly be, we've got eight people here that will be the resource uh, to help you, any of our members um, get connected. But um, I do know that we've got a lot of great bankers out there that are all networked well, that will share information that they have. Um, let's see if we can get through a few more questions here. Um, Let's see, what is the rationale for not including the 7.65 withheld from employee paychecks? That's part of gross payroll, so it does not seem right. Uh, so you're referring to the uh, FICA taxes? Yes. So, oh, now, now it gets complicated. Um, there are other tax provisions that either eliminate certain payroll taxes or certain federal taxes um, to try to shore up liquidity. And the reason they're deducted from the calculation is that the lawmakers did not want people to be able to take advantage of 
two types of federal resources that do the same thing. So for instance, um, payroll tax is deferred for um, I think six months to a year and you have until 2022 to pay back a significant component of that. And so the, the lawmakers, the rationale was if you're already providing a payroll tax, you shouldn't have an additional benefit of adding that payroll, the federal payroll tax into a calculation for a different type of the same type of stimulus. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, the, uh, Let's see. The question is not specifically for businesses, but I wondered if you have heard any discussions about providing funding for paid sick leave or emergency FMLA for city, county, state employees. Um, have you heard anything about this so far? Uh, I, I have not. I know that uh, many states are approaching it differently, all with the intention of helping, but all with different wrinkles. Um, let's see, are the sole member, sole proprietor eligible for the loan forgiveness with PPP? Uh, yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yeah. Okay. And I think we've talked about the guidelines on spending the money. Let's see, trying to get through these. Um, a couple new ones just came in. Um, this was asked a couple different ways, but the length for getting the loan approved um, I think you said earlier in the presentation, it, it's, you know, I know everybody's overwhelmed and learning on the fly, like we were learning at the beginning of our webinar. <laughs> um, but uh, are you, would you think a couple of weeks? I know the um, idle loan, uh, we applied for that even at the chamber. I think some chambers are applying for that um, and, you know, have not received the funding yet. So that was a week ago. Do you have any idea? Uh, yeah, so I, I expect that the idle loans, the dis SBA disaster loans, will be four to seven weeks to get through the backlog just based on past disaster experience. Uh, the intention is for the PPP loans to be a lot quicker. Okay. Let's see. Um, and the availability for churches and nonprofits, um, what was the change from Saturday that you mentioned? So churches and nonprofits are organized um, by different parts of the tax code, and there was lack of clarity on whether they could receive assistance or not. And over the weekend, um, Treasury and SBA issued guidance saying they are eligible to receive um, the resources. Okay, great. Um, okay. Let's see, if a small business S Corp doesn't have a payroll company and submits payroll taxes monthly, but reports quarterly on the 941 form, do they just not pay those monthly and then report the quarterly as deferred? The only information available at the moment says contact your payroll specialist. Uh, does this include all payroll taxes, Medicare, Social Security? Um, so you kind of covered that, but. You, you really got to talk with your financial advisor. There are complexities okay. in, in different business structures. There are different complexities, certainly, and there are different conse uh, tax consequences because of it. So I uh, really got to sit down with, with whoever you rely on for financial advice. Sometimes it's a uh, accountant, sometimes it's um, an attorney, sometimes it's both. Um, this is the time to do it. Okay, let's see. Uh... One that just came in. Um, is there a PPP checklist of information? Um, there is, and I think we have that on our chamber resource um, information and um, we'll double check it. I'm assuming the US Chamber has some information out there as well. Sort of uh, the yeah. checklist of documents. Yes, uh, we're directing as many small businesses as possible to our small business digital portal, which is uschamber.com slash co again that's uschamber.com slash co um, pretty incredible sets of toolkits and information all in a way that is pretty easy to find um, it can be really i mean and you know it can be really overwhelming you get on some of these websites and it um it, it's really hard to find information i've been very impressed with 
our, dig our small business digital platform. They're trying to um, not only make it easy to find, but if, let's just say there are three articles um, on, that you immediately see on uschamber.com slash co. The one article is top six survival tips. Another article is uh, what you need to know about the CARES Act. The thing that's so great about these is that in both of those articles, all of the links and information is updated at least twice a day. So you, you don't just have to find the perfect article. You can find any article and at least be comfortable that that information is, is up to date. Yeah, it, it's been a great resource and we link to all of that on our uh, COVID resource page on our website too. So you can always just uh, look there as well, but um, we've, we've definitely been utilizing the great information that your team's been putting out. It's, it's Thank you. remarkable. Let's see, I, whoops. I think we we'll um, probably, probably have time for one more, one more question and then, and then, think, uh, and let's then see. certainly always available for you, um, you know, morning, noon and night on, on email too. Uh, okay, for the PPP loan, if my employees I laid off found another found other employment, mm -hmm. if I use those funds to hire new employees, would I still be able to get loan forgiveness? Uh, yes, if 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 the um, if the seventy five percent go towards payroll and and uh, the other twenty five percent are within the um, eligible spending guidelines, then absolutely yes. Okay. Okay. And just real quick, are there any restrictions on that? Um, the EIDL grant, the 10,000, are there restrictions on that? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I didn't think so. Great. Well, Tom, I cannot thank you enough for taking time. I know you are super busy. You guys are working so hard out there for all of us. Um, I really appreciate it. You've been amazing. Um, and I appreciate everybody that has taken the time to uh, tune in and ask some questions. And if we didn't get to everybody's question, we will uh, make sure that we circle back and answer them. And of course, you can email um, our chamber staff at any time. And we're working with all of our local, state, federal partners to track down answers for things that um, that we don't, you know, like you said, there's a lot to take in. So we're learning as well. Well, Ann, right back at you. I mean, um, getting this information out is hard, but you and 6,000 of your closest friends and chambers around the country are making it a lot easier. And uh, because of our tremendous partnership, we're, we get more and more comfort that no one will shut their doors not knowing that there are resources available. And, and I say that because the incredible job you're doing uh, for the Shawnee Chamber and, and your colleagues across the country to make sure that your members have the best information. Thank you, thank you. Well, wonderful. Well, with that, um, we will let you go. I know you have a busy day. Um, this webinar um, was recorded, so we will upload it again to our COVID resource page on our website. So for businesses that are out there, our participants, if you want to share that with another business, um, please do so. Our information is out there for everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ian. All right. Stay healthy. Thank you, too. Bye-bye.